Hello, welcome to part 3 of temperature and resistance. We're going to talk about superconductivity. We're going to take a look at what superconductivity is, what the key properties of a superconductor are, and some uses for superconductors. Let's start with this graph. On the y-axis we have the resistance of something and on the x-axis the absolute temperature. That's the temperature in Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is absolute zero, minus 273 degrees centigrade. If I take a sample of something like copper and cool it down, the resistance falls and settles down to a final steady value at zero Kelvin. That value is called the residual resistance. Now copper is not a superconductor. Its resistance at zero has some value. Let's do the same thing with mercury. If I take a sample of mercury and measure its resistance, it will fall as the temperature drops. But at some temperature, something rather interesting happens. The resistance drops to zero. And if we get even colder, it stays zero. So there's a range of temperatures from absolute zero up to some certain value where the mercury has zero resistance. I don't mean a very small resistance, I mean zero resistance. In this state it's said to be superconducting. Of course if we warm it up the reverse happens. When we reach this temperature the resistance suddenly rises up again and as we increase the temperature further the resistance continues to rise. The temperature where the change occurs is called the transition temperature or the critical temperature and different materials have different transition temperatures and the symbol for transition temperature is T subscript C to remind us it's also called critical temperature. So let's look at a few materials. Copper doesn't superconduct so it doesn't have a transition temperature even though it's a very good conductor at room temperature it doesn't form a superconductor. Mercury does though. Its transition temperature is 4.2 Kelvin. Mercury was the first superconductor to be discovered back in 1911. It was cooled to this temperature with liquid helium. Another example, tungsten. Very small transition temperature, 0.015 Kelvin. You can make superconductors from complex materials. Here's one yttrium barium copper oxide, sometimes called YBCO. Its transition temperature is relatively high, 92 K, but that's still very cold. Materials like this are often referred to as high temperature superconductors because the transition temperatures are relatively high compared to some of the other things we're looking at. It's worth noting that the boiling point of liquid nitrogen is 77 K. If you're looking for a good, not too expensive superconductor, one that can be kept superconducting without something like very expensive liquid helium, it'd be very useful to find ones with transition temperatures above 77 K. That means they can be kept superconducting by keeping them in liquid nitrogen. So researchers look for things with high transition temperatures. Of course the ideal would be a, something with a transition temperature at 20 degrees C say because that would mean it wouldn't have to be cooled at all but whether such materials can be made is well it seems unlikely but researchers are working on it. Let's look at the properties. First of all zero electrical resistance in the superconducting state. That means very large currents can flow. But the, can't, but the current is not unlimited. You can't have infinite currents. There's a maximum current density. Current density means the size of the current divided by the cross-sectional area. And if the current density exceeds a certain value, the superconductor reverts to being a normal conductor. When it's superconducting, of course, there are no heating losses. The power loss in the resistor is I squared R. If R is zero, P is zero. So superconductors don't waste energy by turning it into heat. The other key property of a superconductor is that it exhibits the Meissner effect. And the Meissner effect is an effect which says that superconductors 
repel magnetic fields. They can't have a magnetic field inside of them. And as a consequence, it's possible to have magnetic levitation. If you have a superconductor and a magnet over the top, the magnet has a magnetic field around it and the superconductor repels that. And the magnet can be levitated over the superconductor. Of course, the magnet's weight must be less than the force due to the repulsion of the magnetic field. And again, this is only true up to a certain point. Very strong magnetic fields can penetrate into a superconductor, and when that happens, they stop it superconducting, and it returns to being a normal conductor. So it's only valid up to certain field strengths. How do superconductors work? Well, it's a difficult question. There are two types of superconductor referred to as type 1 and type 2. Type 1 superconductors we think we understand pretty well. The theory is called the BCS theory. Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer worked it out. And the theory says that inside a superconductor the electrons form pairs called Cooper pairs. And these pairs of electrons can move through the lattice without transferring energy to the lattice. So they can move without any resistance. There are other superconductors called type 2 superconductors and generally these include the high temperature superconductors and no one fully understands how they work. So people are working on that right now. Let's go through a few uses. Because of the zero resistance we can make very powerful electromagnets. We have a coil of superconducting wire with a large current and it generates very large magnetic fields. These are need, needed in things like MRI scanners used in hospital, magnetic resonance imaging scanners, and the LHC, LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, Switzerland, a particle accelerator, uses superconducting magnets to control the particle beams. You can get generators and motors that use superconducting coils, and they're much more efficient than conventional motors and generators. In the future it might be possible to have power transmission without the wasting of heat. If you have the national grid system carrying current from place to place a huge amount of energy is, is wasted heating up the wires. So with superconducting methods it might be possible to eliminate those. But of course you've got to keep the superconductors cold enough below the transition temperature. Other uses, magnetic levitation trains, maglev trains. The magnetic levitation process, the Meissner effect, can be used to support a train. And that removes all the resistance of wheels. And trains can go very fast. You can make frictionless bearings where the magnetic levitation means there's no contact friction. Squids are very interesting devices. Superconducting quantum interference devices. They're very sensitive, they measure very tiny magnetic fields. They'll even measure the magnetic field produced by currents in nerve cells in the brain. Very, very sensitive. These are just a few of the uses of superconductors and if you want to find out more there's plenty out there. Okay, that's all we need to say about superconductors, so thanks for watching.